Hi folks, uh, welcome back to Bennett's Chemistry 12 Tutorials. Um, today uh, we're getting into the unit which is called titration, which is really just an extension of the acid-base unit um, because we're going to be looking specifically at acid-base titrations and some of the principles involved in, in what titration is, how to use it, um, and some of the a little more um, the subtleties of titration that you didn't learn in chemistry 11 even though you probably did do an acid-base titration um, okay so obviously this is going to be fairly challenging because titration is actually a, a, an experimental technique so uh, me just being in the house here uh, it's gonna be hard for me to actually be able to demonstrate it and to be honest with you you actually learn most about titration by actually doing titration so um, you're gonna get a lot of the theory and the principles behind it all but until you actually get your hands on the equipment uh, it's it's hard to get those things to kind of go into your head so I'll do the best that I can at trying to explain some of the principles and trying to keep them um, fairly straightforward so that when you do get that opportunity to get in there and actually get your hands on the stuff you'll kind of know what uh, you're talking about in some of those principles that are there okay so um, titration so we're gonna start today's gonna be um, primarily uh, a qualitative class it's not gonna be a lot of quantitative things even though I mean really titration is a very quantitative thing we're gonna get into the kind of the big picture ideas here of titration, um, what it is in general, some of the principles, some of the equipment that you're going to see, how you set it up, how you do it, um, some of the the measurement kind of subtleties that you have to be aware of before before we actually get into um, the the doing the math part of it all. Okay, so uh, let's start off with what is titration, um, and essentially up there, why is it used? Like why bother? So titration is a laboratory technique um, that is used for the analysis of an unknown uh, reactant. Okay, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to mix two chemical reactants to do a chemical reaction, obviously. Um, but you're trying to figure out what is the, the number of moles of an unknown um, reactant in solution or in a solid chunk or or you're trying to find how many moles of something you have and you try to find out how many moles you have of that unknown by reacting it in a very controlled fashion and that's what titration is it's a very controlled addition of another reactant so the principle is that if you add just the right amount of reactant to each other or reactants I guess plural to each other that you can hit the perfect stoichiometry where you don't have any excess of either one of the reactants. And if you can do that, then you can use the reactant that you added because you're adding it in a slow, controlled fashion. And obviously, you would need to know how much you've added, so probably volume and its concentration. And if you do that, you know it's moles. And once you know the moles of one reactant that you've added, and you know your principles of stoichiometry, you can figure out how many moles of the other reactant are there. So the general principle behind a titration is to use a, a controlled addition of one reactant where you know its concentration to another reactant to determine how many moles you have of that thing. Now, that principle can be used in all areas of chemistry, really, if you're trying to, to find out how much you're supposed to be using it or how much of an unknown you have. Um, you'll see, and some of you will um, at some point in your life do a reduction oxidation, which is actually our next and final unit of chemistry 11. Titration is used quite often in redox, uh, even though like it's not an acid base chemical reaction that you're going to be using, but you still use titration. So titration is not an acid base specific concept. It's a chemistry laboratory concept or technique that you can apply to several different kind of areas of chemistry. So we introduce it in Chem 12 um, with the acid base. There's there's a lot of things you can do with it. It fits perfectly with acid and base um, because you can get things to chemically react really well. 
Um, and also you've done it in Chemistry 11, so we're kind of jumping on a skill that you already probably practiced in Chemistry 11. Um, and if you didn't, it's not that big of a deal. Like you can pick this stuff, pick this stuff up pretty easily. Actually, the concept is relatively, um, I wouldn't say simple, but the concept makes logical sense um, once you actually start to to do it. Keep in mind that all you're doing is adding two reactants together to get them to react where there's no excess, but you're doing it in a very controlled fashion so you know exactly how much of one you've added to the other. And kind of keep that one in mind. Okay, so number two up here. What are the key pieces of equipment? Um, and not only what are the key pieces, but what are the basics to the technique? And again, I haven't got the stuff here with me, so it might be a little bit of a challenge. Um, so hopefully you've seen these things around the lab. Hopefully you've even had an opportunity to use them in Chemistry 11. But again, if not, you've probably seen them kind of lying around. When you were in Chem 11 and you never did a titration, well, you probably saw the stuff out for the Chemistry 12 people um, for like the next class or something. So you probably have seen the things. So what are basic kind of pieces of equipment. So I've drawn a picture up here on the board. So over here I've drawn as best I possibly can kind of the setup of a titration. And so you'll see this very typical setup. So you'll see one of the key pieces, not one of the key pieces, the key piece of equipment um, for a titration is a burette. Okay, so a burette is a long uh, graduated glass tube. And so it's a volumetric piece of equipment. And because it's a volumetric piece of equipment, uh, it's quite analytical and typically uh, costs quite a bit of money. So try to avoid smashing them on the floor. So this long piece of glass tube at the end of it has a little spout on it with a, um, a valve that you can open and close. And if you, it's closed if it's at just like typical valves are. If this is the pipe, if my right arm is the pipe and the pen is the valve, the valve has the pipe turned off so nothing can flow through it when it's perpendicular to it. When it's in line, it's open and stuff can free flow. Now, what is interesting about about valves of this nature is oftentimes if you're at a varying degree in between them, you can, you can kind of change the speed of the flow. And actually in titration, once you get really good at it, you'll know kind of by subtly with your hand be able to feel where one drop or even you can get like half a drop hanging out the tip of the the little spout you'll be able to control the flow to that degree remember what i said earlier this is a controlled addition so you don't just kind of open the thing up and fire stuff out the bottom and you go oops i might have added a little bit too much there what you do is you start with the thing closed you open it up, you get really close to it, and then you stop it, and then you slowly start adding a little, you open a little bit, and so you start adding it and adding it and adding it. Now, we'll get to it in a sec, but there, there obviously has to be an indication that you're coming really close to the reaction being finished, like you've added just the right amount of reactant together. So we'll get to that one in just a sec. So that's the burette you're going to add solution to it. It doesn't need to be to the very top increment. It doesn't obviously need to be the very top. But I'm going to get into the details of the burette in just a little bit here because the actual reading of the burette and the and its level of precision and, and how to actually use the thing so you don't mess up, those are kind of critical skills to know. So the burette is being this big long glass tube. You don't have to stand there or have your partner stand there and hold the thing the whole time. So there's burette clamps and typically in chem labs there's, there's a tool for the job every single time. So the burette clamp is, I mean there's different varying versions of them but they tend to just kind of clamp onto the glass tube and they they're pretty tight on there. So they clamp onto the glass tube and then you put your burette clamp, you attach it onto a ring stand. Okay? And you've probably all seen ring stands before. So there's a ring stand. And then sitting down there underneath the burette is your Erlenmeyer flask and it's got a narrow neck to it and a wide bottom and they're specifically designed for mixing. So you can grab the narrow neck and you can kind of swirl the contents down in the bottom and it doesn't splash out. One thing that I try and 
make sure that my students do technique wise is that the Erlenmeyer flask you always try and have it so that the tip of the spout of the burette is down below the brim of the Erlenmeyer flask just so that you don't um, accidentally pour some <laughs> you happen to miss um, I don't know sometimes if you're not paying attention or something you can move the Erlenmeyer and then you miss the thing and anyways that's that's a whole nother can of worms so essentially what you're doing is down here in the Erlenmeyer flask you're putting um, typically, it's not always this way, but typically you're putting a sample of an unknown down in there. Now, by unknown, it may not be like completely unknown. I have no idea what this thing is. You might know that it's a solution of hydrochloric acid. You might know that it is a solution of a diprotic acid. You might know something about it. What you don't know, perhaps, is perhaps you don't know the concentration of the HCl. Perhaps you don't know the identity of the diprotic acid. So there are certain um, unknown things about your solution down there. Oftentimes it's um, the concentration of it and sometimes it's even the actual identity of it. And you'll see that titration as we get more detailed into this Titration will give you enough information to actually go back and use your skills of um, from the acid base unit and hydrolysis to be able to identify what this thing is. Okay. Now that's the, the basic setup. A couple extra things here. Number one, that um, down here in the Erlenmeyer flask, remember we're mixing two things together, in particular with acid base. Acids and bases, they tend not to be uh, colored solutions, right? They tend to be colorless, clear and colorless solutions. So when you mix two clear and colorless solutions, generally speaking, you're going to get a clear and colorless mixture at the end of it, unless some precipitation happens, which is not going to happen with an acid and base, typically. So how are you going to know visually when you've added enough acid and base together to be able to tell if the reaction is over? Right? Like the whole point is you're supposed to be adding a in a controlled fashion, you're supposed to be adding one to the other, adding an acid to a base or a base to an acid, whichever. But it's in a controlled fashion and then you stop when you've added the perfect amounts. How are you supposed to know that? Well, what we do know about acids and bases is that once they've reacted with each other, there are certain pH changes that go along with it. Like if you've taken the perfect amount of acid and you've added it to the perfect amount of base, you have no excess of either one. What products of that reaction do you make? And the products of the reaction, okay, so from your previous experience, and this is going to change slightly, but from previous experience was you made water and a salt. So acid plus base makes water and a salt. Well, you've kind of been taught in the past that those are going to be neutral. And so we know that there's going to be changes, perhaps not visually, but there are going to be changes pH-wise when this reaction is done. And so that's where you're putting your indicator, which is a chemical which changes color at different pHs. Okay, they're usually organic chemicals, and depending on whatever pH you put them in, they change from one color to the other because they're chemical structure changes. So this is typically where we put the indicator. So it sits down there, and as we add controlled fashion, we add one reactant to the other. As soon as we get to that point where the acid and the base have perfectly matched each other, the indicator is going to change color. Okay, so it's typically where we're putting our indicator down here. Now, another thing that I also advise my students to do is I tend to, or not tend to, I advise them to put a piece of white paper underneath um, their Erlenmeyer flask just so that they can see the color change. So in for future, when you actually get back into a lab and you actually get to do this, a little tip from the tour there, put a white surface underneath it and you'll be able to see the color change a little bit easier rather than looking at the base of the the ring stand or the tabletop or whatever you've got the thing on okay and so there's that's what you're doing you're taking your solution from up here and you're adding it in now i'm going to talk a little bit more about those solutions and what you need to do and the technique and stuff in just a minute so a couple of things that we got to know number one the burette 
Okay, so the burette's kind of an interesting thing because you pour out the bottom of it. And because you pour out the bottom of it, the increments on it are slightly different than, say, a graduated cylinder, which is also a vertical glass tube. A graduated cylinder sits on your desk and you fill it and how much you pour in, kind of, it tells you how much you've poured in. This one is designed to tell you how much you've poured out. So not poured in, poured out, which means the increments are slightly different. The zero for a burette is the top number. Okay, so the very top increment is the zero milliliter level. Now, if you want to know exactly how much without having to do any math, if you add in whatever you're adding, you add it in, maybe pull out a little dropper and you start kind of medicine droppering it in drop by drop by drop to get it right on the zero. Okay, you pour out the bottom, whatever it goes down to, that's what it's going to be. Okay, you don't have to because you can always, you know, if I started up here, if I started at one milliliter, and I poured out to 25 milliliters. Well, if I started at one and I went down to 25, the difference is 24. So I will be able to tell how much I poured out. It doesn't have to start at zero. It might make the math easier, but that's about it. The other thing about the burette is it goes down to 50. And the last increment is 50. If you go below that, it's not measuring it anymore. So um, you're still pouring stuff out the bottom, but you're not going to have anything to measure what you've poured out. So if you start up here at zero and you're just kind of adding this stuff like a mile a minute and you're adding and adding and adding and you're not paying attention and, and it drops down below the 50, then you have no idea once you go beyond that 50, you have no idea exactly how much you've added because you went past the increment. So you have to be very careful. You can... You start up here and you pour and pour and pour and pour and it gets it's getting really close to the 50 and you're worried you're going to go past that 50. You can always stop, record where it went down to, right? Because then let's say I started at zero and I stopped at 49. Well, I've poured in 49 so far. If I just re-add some more solution up, up here, go back up to zero again, and then from zero I go down to 12, well, now I've poured in 49 from the kind of the first go through plus another 12. So I've added a total of 61. Okay, so you can continuously add. You just have to make sure you never go outside of the increments so you know exactly how much you've added. And then you can just refill. Okay, so keep that one in mind because that's another kind of that's another tricky one for later on. Another thing about, uh, about the burette. Okay, before I get into the actual measurement over here. When you first fill your bread, like when you're starting your whole thing, and you've got the little stopper closed, right? So here's the burette and the, and the valves down here. And you start with it closed, obviously, because if you're going to fill up here at the top where my fingers are, you don't want the thing open. So you're pouring in whatever solution you're pouring in. It's pouring out the bottom all over your table and the floor and yourself, and your books and everything else. So you start with it closed, obviously, and you fill the thing up. However, as soon as you open it, there's a little bit of space below where the valve is. It's just filled with air because there's nothing there. And so what happens is the first, I don't know, it's maybe half a milliliter of drop that you pour out is actually the air pouring it out. So and it's called filling the tip. When you're doing a titration, you always got to fill the tip. So you'll add the solution in, the thing will be closed. And into a waste beaker, you just kind of squirt some out to fill the tip. And then you close it. And then what happens, kind of like a little vacuum effect, the little bit below, okay? So like if here's the valve, then down here where my elbow is, that bit right there then gets filled with a solution. So now when I open it and a drop pours out or a squirt pours out or whatever, if it drops half a milliliter up here where my fingers are, that means half a milliliter of solution dropped out the bottom and not air. Okay, so it's called filling the tip. Make sure you always fill the tip. Um, the other thing is when you're first setting up, you always have to rinse the burette with one time, just a little bit of solution of whatever you were going to pour in there to get rid of the, kind of the excess water and stuff that you use to rinse the thing out before you got going. 
So if I'm going to pour some base up into here, some solution that I'm, I'm using a base and I'm pouring it in there, I would rinse with a, maybe 5-10 milliliters of base and I would pour it out into a waste container. Just to rinse um, out any of the other solutions that might have gone through there previously. Probably water because you were probably rinsing it before you got going. Okay, so that's the that's that. The burette also reading it. Okay, so I wanted to show the subtleties in reading it. So burettes typically have increments that are every 0.1 mils. Okay, and so you'll see, and up here on the board, what I've got is I've got just two of the one milliliter increments, and then you can see that there's little sub increments along the way. So I've got 5.0. And remember, burettes read from top to bottom, so 0 down to 50. So if I took a close-up view, there's the 5, there's the 6, down here would be the 7. And obviously up here is the 4, and so on and so on and so forth. And then all the little 0.1 increments down there. So whenever a glassware company puts an increment on an actual measuring device, a volumetric device, they are certain of that value. They're certain, it's the level of precision, they are certain of that. What they are uncertain of is everything in between. So, kind of looking at what I've put up here, if you consider that blue curve, kind of the top of the, the column of solution that I put into my burette. So imagine I filled my burette and it's up here and it's just above that five. It's clearly above that five, right? I like you can see there's you can see the gap in between the line for the five and where that blue curve is. So imagine down here is all filled in with whatever solutions in there. So what volume is the burette actually reading right now? So if you look at this very carefully, what is the burette certain of? The burette is certain that the line across there is 5.0. It is certain, can I draw the arrow? That's not a very good arrow, that looks funny. It is certain that the little increment right above that is 4.9. And so that water is clearly between 4.9 and 5.0. So what do you write down? Well, you don't write down 4.9 and you don't write down 5.0. You don't take the one that it's closest to. It is certain the burette, the company that made the burette, is certain that it's greater than 5. Point, or 4.9, but smaller than 5.0. Well, what are all the things between 4.9 and 5.0? So all of those decimals, okay, so four in front of all of those until you get to 5.00. What the thing is certain of, that it's 4.9, it's not even certain it's 4.90. That zero, like 4.90, that zero would be uncertain. The Burette Glassware Company is uncertain of what that second decimal place is, that hundredth of a milliliter. They're certain of the tenth. They are uncertain of the hundredth. So it is the observer's job to determine the uncertain value. If you don't write it, what you're saying, if you write the number 4.9, you're writing that the 9 is uncertain. The glassware company is not uncertain about the 9. They're certain about the 9. They are uncertain about what comes after the 9. Is it a 0? Okay. Is it a 1? Is it a 2? What is it? Okay, so what is it? It's your guess. It's my guess. We're probably going to come close to the same thing as long as we're looking at the same thing and in the same fashion. So that's why your teachers will always say to you, get to eye level, 
and measure the bottom of the meniscus, right? Because water inside of a tube tends to cling on to the edges of the tube, and so it sticks onto the edges while gravity pulls the middle of the tube down, or the middle of the column down. So you want the middle of that column, because that's where it actually, that's the true volume of where the, the thing is, the water's clinging up to the sides. So you want the bottom, so it's typically right in the middle. So I want to measure wherever that bottom is. Okay, so you got to get right in there. And if you're not at eye level, what happens is you get a little bit of refraction of the light. So if you're a little above it and you're looking down at it, the glass and the water itself will cause some refraction. And so you won't see it properly. It's like when you look through a glass of water at your friends on the other side, their eyeballs look weird or their face looks big over here and then it looks small over there. It's because there's refraction going on. So you don't want to be above it. You don't want to be below it. You want to be right smack dab eye level with the meniscus. So you got to get right in there, get in close, and you've got to determine what this is. So I'm looking at this and I'm kind of saying to myself, I have to guess what this thing is. It's not 4.91 in my own view because it's not barely past the 4.9. It's actually quite close to the 5.0. So I actually, I would guess, I think it's that guy. You might think 9.7 or 9.9. None of us are gonna say it's 5.00 because it's not actually sitting on the increment. So therefore, you have to guess at that uncertain digit, okay? So that volume would be, I'm gonna say that guy is 4.98 milliliters, okay? Now let's say I pour out the bottom because pouring out the bottom is what you do in a titration. You have your burette, you pour out the bottom. So this value changes, right? This is gonna drop from there to somewhere. So let's pretend it drops to down There. So what volume is that? Well, okay, bottom of the meniscus is the middle section. So I'm going to take that, and in my mind's eye, I'm gonna draw a line over there. Now, when you're actually looking at a burette, you can kind of see the increments. You can, they'll be right there. They, they go almost all the way across. So you'll be able to kind of line up the meniscus with your eyes and, and with the increment and be able to tell where the thing is. So here, I'm gonna guess this isn't quite to that increment. So what are those two increments? So 6.0, this guy is 6.1, this guy is 6.2. So it's almost at the 6.2, clearly beyond the 6.1. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it's not at 6.2, you might. If you say it's at 6.2, then you would write down 6.20. Got to add that zero because it's the uncertain digit. I would disagree with you. I would say that it's 6.19. Who's right? Me? Because I'm the teacher? No. Um, it is you are the observer. And so you are observing what the uncertain digit is, okay? Now, there is obviously some degree of uncertainty in this in, in terms of the observer as well. So the more skilled and practiced you are, probably you've seen a few more things, but whatever, your eyes can work as good as mine. So you can, your guesstimate is as good as mine, okay? So you've gotta make that uncertain um, digit. You've got to put it in there. Okay, and all burettes will do this. Okay, so then I ask you the question, well, if those are my two numbers, if 4.98 was my initial burette reading and 6.19 was my final burette reading, how much did I pour out the bottom? Well, I poured out the bottom, whatever the two subtracted from each other are. So 6.919 minus 5, 4.98 is 0 0.21 it's not a zero. 
that would be a one. So 1.21 milliliters were poured out. Reading the beer ad is actually a critical skill. I know it sounds kind of, well, it's reading a beer ad. How challenging can that be? It's more challenging than you think. Now, the more you do, um, the better you get at it. And if you're constantly thinking, I gotta be at eye level, I gotta get in there close, and I've gotta make sure I have the uncertain digit, you'll get good at it pretty quickly. Another little tip from the tour is, depending on whatever color the increments are, sometimes some burettes, they're etched in and they're white. Take a black background, okay? So your calculator, a black piece of paper, and put it in behind, you'll see the increments a little bit better. If they are black increments on a burette, then put a white piece of paper in behind, you'll be able to see the increments a little bit better. They kind of, they're, they're more contrast than if you go with the opposite color of, of paper. Okay, now that's kind of the, the general principle. So you're gonna add solution into here. You're gonna dump it out. Sorry, you're gonna add solution in. You're gonna fill the tip. You're going to take an initial reading. Then you're gonna add that solution down into the Erlenmeyer, into your unknown, until you stop. Okay, and the stopping is going to be indicated by whatever chemical indicator you have in there. And it's the visual clue. Now, for titration, which is an interesting thing, and we're going to do this one later, you can put a pH probe in as well. And every single time you add in half a milliliter, a milliliter, whatever it would be, depending on how precise you want your graph to be, you can actually graph the changes in pH over time. So let's pretend I started with acid down here and, I, and I've got my base up in here. If you take the pH meter and put it into the Erlenmeyer flask and then you're recording, okay, well initially it's going to be super acidic obviously because it's all acid, it's going to have a low pH. Then you add one little bit of base. Well one little base, little bit of base isn't going to neutralize it totally, but it's going to make it slightly less acidic. And so the pH might go up a fraction like just a little bit, but still gonna be acidic. And it will keep being acidic until you start to slowly eat away the acid. And then all of a sudden, you're gonna add the perfect amount of base and the pH is gonna shoot up, shoot up to seven. Maybe you're gonna add just a little bit too much base or because you want a graph, you actually wanna continue adding base and it's gonna shoot past seven and it's gonna shoot way up to 10, 11, 12, 13, who knows? And then you're gonna get this very distinctive graph. So you can actually do this stuff without an indicator, but with a pH meter and a graph, which we'll get to in a later episode, okay? So that's these are the fundamental principles of the, of the technique, okay? So on to number three here. What are the chemical and the stoichiometric principles that we're applying here in, in titrations? So number one, um, the chemical principles we're taking, and we're, remember we're talking about acids and, and bases here. So we're taking an, an acid-base reaction, and one of the principles we have to keep in mind with when you're doing a titration is you want the reaction to go 100%. Right? You want to be able to use that that chemistry 11 principle with with stoichiometry, where you react your reactants fully, right? They go down to zero, or for all intents and purposes, zero. So having a chemical reaction between an acid and a base that doesn't go 100%, um, and it's there, you're talking about weak things, and there's an equilibrium, and uh, that's really what you want to avoid in a titration. You want the reaction to go 100%. So if you're adding an acid and a base, you want to make sure that they are going to react in a 100% fashion. Now, you know what types of things are going to react in a 100% fashion. Strong acids go 100%. So if I have a base that I'm trying to find out information about, it's the unknown. I know it's a base because I can test with pH paper or a probe or something like that. So I've got this unknown base. I want to make sure because I don't know if the base is weak or strong or what it's going to do. I want to make sure that I'm titrating with a strong acid to force whatever acid-base reaction I do, the neutralization that I do, to force it to go 100% to the products. On the other side of that coin, if I have an acid, and I know it's an acid because I've tested it with pH paper, whatever means I've done, 
I want to make sure that I add a strong base to ensure that regardless of what the acid is, it's going to go 100%. So that's actually a really important chemical principle that you're applying to titrations, is that you always want to do a strong something reaction. Okay, so in titrations, you'll see, and as we go into further um, episodes here, you'll see we'll be talking about strong, strong titrations or strong, weak titrations. We'll never talk about weak, weak titrations because you're ignoring that principle that you want the reaction to go 100% so that you can actually use your stoichiometry um, where the reactants run out. Okay, so that's a really important chemical principle. Always be thinking we've got to have a strong in there to make it go 100%. The second thing that, that is important to know is the stoichiometric principles here. And the stoichiometric principles, and there's a couple of key terms here to all of this. And so let me just write down just a, a sample thing. If I have um, an unknown, let's say I've got an uh, unknown acid. Okay, and it's HX, but I've got it in aqueous solution. So a couple of things about titration that are really kind of critical here is that um, we're reacting it with A, the strongest, the, an important principle is the strong. So I'm going to choose a very commonly used strong base, sodium hydroxide, and it's going to go 100%. <clears throat> Now, when I, when I do a titration, when I do an acid-base titration, I'm trying to take that strong combo so that it goes 100%. But from a stoichiometric point of view, the critical thing that I'm trying to do when I'm adding in a controlled fashion out of the burette into the Erlenmeyer flask is I'm trying to figure out how many moles of that unknown acid are there. So I'm gonna kind of jump here. So to number four, what information does the titration give you? The titration gives you the moles of the unknown. That's all it does. Now from the moles of the unknown, you can do a whole bunch of things. You can do concentration. From concentration, you can do Ka's percent ionization. Um, from the moles, you could figure out the mass of the acid that's in the solution. You can figure out uh, percent composition. There's a whole bunch of different things that you can do. But really, titration is just trying to figure out the moles of the unknown. That's all it is. And so you need to know um, what is the stoichiometry of the chemical reaction that you're talking about. So it's important to know, is this acid monoprotic? Or is this acid diprotic? Or is this acid triprotic? Because if it's monoprotic, and this guy makes water, okay, so the OH and the H form water, and then you make a solution of whatever salt that would be, it's a sodium salt of X, that's going to be one to one to one to one. What if it was a diprotic acid? and it was chemically reacting. Well, again, it still makes water, and it makes a salt, sodium salt, because it was sodium, sodium salt of whatever that anion was. Now, because it's a diprotic acid, that anion is negative two. So this sodium salt is Na2X. Well, from a stoichiometric point of view, this is now, to balance it, you have to put twos in front of that. So actually, when you're trying to figure out how many moles of acid are in there, it's not just a one-to-one -one relationship anymore. Now you've got to take into consideration the stoichiometry. It takes two moles of sodium hydroxide for every one mole of the acid that you put in there. And what's different about the titration stuff is you remember when I was talking about polyprotic acids, and if you don't, I'll I'll refresh your memory. Polyprotic acids get rid of their H's in stages when left unto themselves in the water. They get rid of them in stages. The first H comes off way easier than the second H. When you're talking about a titration and you're talking about a 100% reaction, 
because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to make it go 100%. You just keep adding NaOH, and NaOH will grab an H off of any acid, no matter how strong it is. It doesn't care if it's stage one or stage two. Who cares? So there are two H's to pull off here. It's going to take two sodium hydroxides to rip those H's off, and it doesn't care about the stages. Okay, we'll see how the stages plays out later, but you can't tell the difference. You can't see it in the solution, and the sodium hydroxide doesn't really care either. It just it pulls all the H's off, so you're not actually done the titration until all of those H's come off which means the stoichiometry is not necessarily one-to-one -one and you won't know that. Now, there are ways of determining, and it'll be in a visual form and with a graph, there are ways to tell if you've got a monoprotic or a diprotic acid, if it's truly unknown. But you have to take that into account when you know you've got a diprotic, right? So if I knew, for example, that this was not H2X, I knew it was H2SO4, like the acid is H2SO4. I just want to know the concentration of, this, of the H2SO4. I know that sodium hydroxide H2SO4 stoichiometry is going to be 1 to 2. I need to be able to take that into account. Now, there is a very important, there's some terminology associated here. First thing that I'm going to write down is something known as the equivalence point. And the equivalence point is sometimes known as the stoichiometric point, and you might hear that from your teachers, stoichiometric point, same thing. So the equivalence point, I'm going to try and, and use the simplest terms here. The equivalence point is when you've added enough of the reactant so there is no excess. So the perfect amount of each one. So in this case, okay, in this case, Let's say I added 0 0.050 moles of NeOH. The stoichiometric point or equivalence point of that titration would be 0 0.050 moles of the HX. That is known as the equivalence point. The equivalence point for this one down here, if I had added 0 0.050 moles of this guy, the equivalence point would not have been the same number. The equivalence point would have been 0 0.025 moles of that. Why is it half as much? Because it's in a 1 to 2 ratio. And because for every two sodium hydroxides I add into the water, that gets rid of half as many H2Xs. So the equivalence point is not the exact same moles. It means that you've added the perfect amount so there is no excess. So imagine that if those two have perfectly reacted in a 100% chemical reaction, I have no more of that floating around and no more of that. I have nothing but these two products over here. And using stoichiometry, you would have 0.05 moles of each of those. This one has reached the equivalence point when I've added exactly twice the number of NaOH moles as there were H2X moles. So that, again, this one completely used up that one, and there is zero excess moles of either one of them in there. Okay. Again, you're adding it in a, in a controlled fashion. And so because you're adding it in a controlled fashion, you stop when you reach that point. Okay. However, you're going to have a really hard time knowing exactly when you're down to the molecule where that point is. That is a really hard thing to do, even in one drop out of a, like if I'm doing my little burette and I'm my valve is closed and I add it just a little bit and I drop out one drop. That one drop has a lot of molecules in it. I mean, we're talking chemistry, so even a drop has tons in it. And so it's really, really hard to actually hit the true equivalence point. As a matter of fact, you're not going to. Let's just, let's call a spade a spade here. 
when you do a titration, you're not going to hit the equivalence point. You're trying to hit the equivalence point, obviously, but you're not going to, okay? It's literally impossible to do it. So instead, what we call in chemistry, we're, our goal is the equivalence point, but what we truly get to is what's known as the end point, and the end point is where our indicator is telling us we've reached the end, so we see a color change. Okay, so remember when I had the equipment set up and we put an indicator indicator molecule down in the Erlenmeyer flask and we add in a controlled fashion one reactant to the other. And as pH changes, you're going to get a color change. As soon as you see that color change, you go, oh boy, we must be at the equivalence point. Or at least in the neighborhood of the equivalence point. And that's kind of the critical principle there, is that the color change of an indicator is going to be, it's in a range. So it's in the neighborhood of where the equivalence point is. Not, it is not the equivalence point. It's in the neighborhood. And so we call that the end point. So the equivalence point versus the end point of a titration are two important concepts to grasp here. Equivalence being the actual stoichiometric point where um, your reactants have completely removed each other and you have zero excess. The end point is where you've stopped adding reactant to the other one because you saw an indicator color change. And so you're in the neighborhood of equivalence point, but you're not exactly on it. Now, for all intents and purposes, your end point is going to be your equivalence point because using significant digits, it's such a small range that you're going to actually see that as long as you're skilled enough to actually stop the titration when you see the color change. Um, you're going to be within a close enough range of where that's going to be to assume that you are you can still do the math at that point. Okay, The more skilled you are at the titration, the closer you're going to get to being able to replicate and actually hit that um, consistent endpoint that you're looking for. Okay, and then you're cl you're getting closer and closer. At least you're you're a little bit more um, precise with your ability and accurate, probably more accurate actually to actually hit the right point. Okay, that equivalence point. Okay. So once we're actually, you get to this this concept of. Okay, I've added enough of this acid and base together. My indicator has changed color. I've reached the end point. And so therefore, I'm close enough to what's known as the equivalence point. Then I can go on to use my skills of stoichiometry and my mole calculations to be able to determine, okay, here's what I had in my um, solution that I was adding in. Here's how many moles I added in. Here's the stoichiometry of the chemical reaction. Here's how many moles of the unknown that I had. And once you get the moles of the unknown that you had, you can do several things from that. Okay? And I'm going to show you in, in a later episode, I'm going to show you what types of things can you actually do. So when you're given a problem, okay, I want you to determine the identity of this unknown acid. Go and do it via titration. Well, Okay, how am I supposed to do that? So I'm going to show a bunch of different things that you can actually do. Okay, and some classes have, um, I know that my class, they get a really long titration lab with multiple parts where they have to determine a whole bunch of different things, identities and KAs and KBs and percent compositions and ionizations and is this strong, is it weak? All of those questions can be answered via titration. Okay, so I'm going to show those things later on. So uh, coming up will be those examples, and I'll do them in just kind of, I don't want to make it too, too long. I'm going to try and hit some very specific topics, okay? So the next few episodes are going to be um, practicing these different types of things that we can do with titration, okay? So hopefully this helps. Again, apologize you can't actually get your hands on the things because you learn more when you actually have your hands on them but hopefully this is enough theory to kind of bring with you until you actually get the chance to do it okay we'll see you next time for the calculation stuff